There's no one-size-fits-all approach to meditation. And this applies both to concentration and insight. Now it is true that the Buddha recommended breath meditation as, in general, the best topic to take. But he recognized that not everybody could get their minds to settle down with the breath. Some people who needed to focus on the unattractiveness of the body, others on recollecting the Buddha, the Brahma Viharas. Concentration is a matter of finding something the mind feels comfortable with. place where it feels it can settle down and be at ease. So you have to explore which of the topics can be your home base. Again, John Lee recommends the breath as a general home base, or at the very least a good place to go. There's that famous passage where the Buddha taught the foulness of the body as a contemplation. Went off into the woods for time by himself, and the monks, in his absence, or many of them, started getting really disgusted with their bodies, to the point where those who had the courage committed suicide, and those who didn't have the courage would hire somebody else to kill them. The Buddha came out from his retreat and noticed that the sun goes a lot smaller. And so he called the monks together, found out from Ananda that what had happened. So he called the monks together and said, when something unskillful comes up in the mind from your meditation, go to the breath. The breath, he said, is like a big rain cloud that comes at the end of the hot season. If you've ever been in India, you know what the hot season is like. It's very dusty. And the rains come and they just wash all the dust out of the air. And the breath functions in that way. It gives the mind something cool and clean refreshing to focus on when contemplation of the body becomes oppressive. So it's a good technique to have in your background. And there are many ways of dealing with it, many things you can do with the breath. Focusing on the impact of the breath on the body, learning how to allow that to calm down, focusing on the feelings that the breath creates. Feelings of pleasure, feelings of rapture, refreshment. Allowing those to calm down. Noticing how you perceive the breath energy in the body. Working with different perceptions that allow the breath to calm down. Using the breath to gladden the mind. Settle it down. Release it from various preoccupations. There's all kinds of things you can do with the breath. John Lee talks about the different kinds of breath energy in the body. It's as if there's no, there are no two talks where he analyzes the breath in the same way. There's a breath energy that circles around in the body. There's a breath energy that moves in and out. There's a breath energy that spreads like a film on the water. It spreads all over the body. There are lots of different ways that you can look at the breath. The breath that comes from the navel up through the neck, out the nose, the breath that comes from the base of the spine up the back. Lots of different ways you can notice the breath energy. And it's up to you to decide which is most calming, which allows you to settle down with the greatest sense of security. And then learn how to content yourself to stay there, what it really means to settle down, so that you can resist any temptation to move around. So there's lots you can do just with this one topic. And same with goodwill. There are lots of different ways you can contemplate goodwill. You can use it as a framework for the rest of your practice. And John Munn, they say, would 
do some mat dye meditation every morning right after he woke up, every afternoon right after he woke up from his afternoon nap, and then every evening before I went to bed. Now you can do this reciting different phrases of goodwill or just stopping to think. What does it mean to have goodwill? What kind of happiness are you wishing? How is that happiness attained? What does it mean to wish for that happiness for everybody? Is there anybody out there that you can't wish that happiness for, that you have trouble? Learn how to straighten your thoughts out around this issue. And if you find you can do that, it's a lot easier to settle down with the breath or whatever your topic of meditation is. Otherwise, they're going to be simmering resentments that don't allow you the measure of happiness that you could find if you could let go of them. So you've got to check out your mind and see what needs to be taken care of. You know, there's unfinished business in terms of resentment or whatever. Take care of that and then settle down with the breath. But here again, the, the instructions are not die hard. Sometimes it's hard to feel goodwill for others unless you can have at least some sense of well-being or refreshment inside for yourself. So work on the breath first until that feels good, and then you can start thinking about goodwill for others. And John Sawat would recommend goodwill meditation at the beginning and at the end of a meditation session. The goodwill at the beginning is for your own sake to sort of clear the decks. Dig out any resentments you might be carrying in from things that happened during the day. And then the meditation goodwill at the end is specifically for, for the purpose of the other people, for their sake. Radiating out some thoughts of harmlessness, thoughts of goodwill. Well, this too is not solely for their sake. You come out of meditation with a sense of ease and well-being. It helps to direct how you're going to deal with other people. You remind yourself, okay, bring goodwill to all your activities, to all the people you meet. It's a good way of setting your intention for the remainder of the day. As for insight, it's a similar principle. There's no one way that you can guarantee insight. There was a fascination in the late 19th, early 20th centuries with mass production, reducing everything to its bare essentials. So you get lots of different people, none of whom had any great skill, but they could all work together and create something. It seems to be a feeling that the same attitude was brought to insight meditation. All you have to do is reduce it to its simplest forms, make it a foolproof method. Just tell people, okay, you do this, this, this. And fold here, insert tab A into slot B here, and there you have it. Insight. But as the Buddha kept saying, you know, ingenuity is an important part of the practice. It's something you have to develop. Not everything can be laid out in a map. And it's your ability to deal with unexpected things as they come up. That's an important part of discernment. And as for the topics you use in general, the Buddha said, it's an issue of learning how to look at fabrication, this process by which the mind creates thoughts, intentions, urges. And you can look at that from any number of angles. From the five aggregates, the six sense media, the six properties, dependent core rising. As a monk once went to see a group of arahants, or several different arahants, one at a time, and asked them, what were you focused on when you gained insight? When you gained awakening, one monk said the five aggregates, another one said the six properties, and someone else said the six sense media, another said Dependent core rising. 
And this upset the monk. He wanted one answer that would work all the way across the board. And here he got a whole series of answers. So we went to see the Buddha. And the Buddha said it's like a riddle tree, which apparently is a coral tree, which is a source of a lot of riddles in many of the nations where it exists. It's an unusual tree. It loses all of its leaves before it, its flowers bloom. So that's sometimes when the tree has nothing on it at all, just black branches, and other times when it has bright red flowers but no leaves, and other times when it has the leaves but no flowers. He says, if you go and see the coral tree when the flowers are out, you're going to describe it one way. When you see it when the leaves are out, you're going to describe it another way, so on down the line. That's the same tree. In the same way, he said, it. there are a lot of different ways that you can be focusing on the process of fabrication. The important thing is you learn how to look at this process of fabrication in a way that begins to depersonalize it. So it's not so much you in there thinking this or that, but just watching that there are these events happening in the mind. Now that we're saying there's nobody in there, it's just that you're not going to be looking with that question in mind. This is an important aspect of insight, is learning how to frame your questions. If you think you're here to trying to prove whether or not there is or is not a self, the Buddha would discourage that. Because that's not the question, that's not the issue. The issue is, how is there suffering? Where in the process of fabrication does the suffering arise? What can you do to put an end to it? When you develop dispassion for the process of fabrication, regardless of how you analyze it, that's the important thing is the dispassion. And when there's dispassion, you begin to realize that you're not simply there watching a movie that's going to go on regardless of you're watching it or not. This movie happens only because you're watching it. In other words, you have a part in the production. And if you lose your passion for the production, it's not just that the movie continues to go on as you walk away. When you're no longer involved, the movie stops. That's why dispassion is followed by cessation. And then finally, relinquishment. Relinquishment of all the, the tools by which you gain that insight. So there's no one-size-fits-all. There are general principles that apply to everybody. That is, in the case of concentration, with insight, it depends on which of the ways of analyzing things makes sense. It helps to emphasize this property of giving rise to a sense of dispassion. It's just this. It's just aggregates, or it's just sense media, or whatever it is. It's just that. And nobody can tell you beforehand which topic is going to induce that sense of, oh, it's just this. So you have to experiment. Fortunately, the range of things you experiment with is not infinite. But you do have to learn how to tell for yourself what's working and what's not. This is why the Buddha included in his meditation instructions not only what to do, but also how to gauge the results. All those different questions he has you ask about the state of your mind, the state of your concentration, the level of disturbance that may be in any level of concentration, the results that insights have on the mind. Notice that it's not you, you take the insight as a prize. It's like that cup in Harry Potter. They go through the maze to get the cup, and they're so happy they get the cup, they latch onto it, and the cup carries them off to, to a point where one of, them, one of the people holding onto the cup actually dies. So we're not here to win the cup of insight. We're here to use the insight for the sake of release. And so the Buddha gives you a whole series of questions for gauging. Did you gain genuine, genuine release from that insight, or just impartial? release. If 
because this is one of the most important parts of the fact that you have to figure out for yourself what's going to work for you. You have to learn how to read the results of your practice and learn how to get more sensitive, more honest, more discerning. in testing the results of your, your concentration, testing the results of your insight. In fact, the process of testing is in and of itself a way of improving your insights. So we're not here to put the mind through a concentration factory or an insight factory. We're learning how to become better and better judges of what we're doing with our own minds. <laughs>